The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit, and the man seated next to me is hoping to get coal in his stocking this year. His name is Mike Roth. Um, Butterfingers makes a coal candy now, and Butterfingers is one of my favorite candies. Uh, you can't Repeat that, there's Butterfinger coal candy? Yes, um, I'm sure it's just a marketing ploy. It's the same old Butterfingers, uh -huh. but it's lumped in. You gotta use your imagination. Use Does that. Does it power. like turn your teeth black when you're eating it? No. Oh, no. See, that's and you weird. can't throw it in a fire. It, it will not. No, if you take one extra lump, it doesn't uh, make Bob Scrooge. Happy. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? But uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to having a big thing of coal, and I hope they know what I'm talking about, and not actually give me that black licorice stuff, which is terrible. I'll be coming down your chimney with some Butterfinger coal. Don't worry. <laughs> You're Whether awesome. You like it or not. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have a chimney, so good luck. We'll figure it out. Uh, this week we have a couple of movies on our streaming spotlight before we get into some really fun movies on the marquee. And I'm going to get us started with the first one. It is a film uh, that is currently on Amazon Prime. It is called The Report. It's written and directed by Scott Z. Burns. Uh, stars Adam Driver as Daniel Jones. And this movie is based on a... Heavily redacted report pertaining to the CIA's new, uh, what they called, enhanced interrogation technique program that yeah. they started. Remember that? Years uh -huh. ago in Guantanamo Bay, where yeah. suddenly we were like, we discovered, hey, let's try waterboarding people and uh, doing all kinds of enhanced interrogation techniques yeah. that the, aren't torture. They don't like the word torture, right. so they had to make a new word. Exactly. <laughs> and so Adam Driver plays Daniel Jones, who is the lead investigator for the Senate Intelligence Committee, who's digging into the facts and gathering data for what would turn out to be a 6,700 page report. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also have Annette Benning in here playing Diane Feinstein. Um, we, John Hamm, Corey Stoll are also in this, and it is um, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of people sitting around in offices in Washington D.C. talking about facts yeah. and figures, you know, and, and kind of moments of uh, seeing what is happening. But uh, you know, it's it's interesting that it, it seems like it would be a very uh, a good thriller almost, you know, as you're dis discovering what's going on. We're torturing people and this mm -hmm. and that. But uh, it kind of lacks a lot of tension, lacks any real sizzle, you know. Um, like I say, a lot of scenes of people just sitting around uploading info. Adam Driver, though, man, he's always good. Like, I, there's something about this guy. I don't know what it is. He kind of plays everything pretty well, he's doesn't he? He's really good in this. Even He's not, like, given enough to take this past the point of, like, just a a pretty interesting movie mm -hmm. um in, in, in but I, I like him and he's really good as like our surrogate the audience's surrogate who's kind of aghast every time he finds out something new that we're doing and and uh you know and digs up this information and, and he kind of has the natural reaction that we would have you know mm -hmm. um there's some good turns in this movie like as he's He's doing something that, you know, it's making him pretty unpopular in D.C. There's a lot of people in D.C. that didn't want this report to come out. Um, and so the best part of this film, I think, is told. There's a lot of flashbacks, especially at the end. Mm -hmm. They start flashing back to things that are revealed, things that all of a when the report is handed in, we start seeing things. There's, like, it's the best parts. Most flashbacks just reading reports? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that's when you, like, see, like, what was actually happening with oh, okay. you yeah. know, as it's being read in the report and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, they kind of add some intrigue to the story. Um, really, the best part of this movie, though, is I, I realized that I could literally just sit and watch Adam Driver just read dialogue. It doesn't have to be really interesting to me because he's interesting enough to make something decent. NPR should get him for chapter of the day. Yeah, yeah. Just, I, I'm okay with it. There's we'll just read something that. I dig about him. So the movie itself was kind of underwhelming, but mm -hmm. uh, it had some interesting things in it. So I give the report three out of five stars. Nice. 
I would love to see out. a movie where flashbacks are something just really boring, like reading a report. Yeah. <laughs> just like, oh. flashback to a guy just like, yeah. flipping the page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, our Adjusting next, his eyeglasses. Our next streaming spotlight, sir, is one of the bigger movies we've had in this realm for a while. Yeah, this is huge. Um, the Irishman, directed by Martin Scorsese. I'm sure you know him by all his great uh, gangster He's done movies. A few movies. He has done a few movies. He gets the gang all back for. A new movie, uh, very similar to um, what he's done in the past. He has Al Pacino, uh, Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, Harvey Keitel, Ray Romano. Uh, it's just a slew of people um, that you expect in one of these mobster sure. movies. But, you know, they're a lot older. They're, I mean, they're a lot older now. Yeah. Um, Al Pacino, he's 79 right now. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, we're, uh, we're going back to the gangster days of the late 50s, early 60s, where... Um, we see a budding young Al Pacino getting into, I mean, not Al Pacino, Robert yeah, De Niro, uh, getting into the mob and then getting status and then eventually becoming a bodyguard for Hoffa, who was huge at the time. Mm -hmm. um, he was a uh, leader of the labor unions yeah, and he was considered extremely, extremely important individual. Um, most people, and they mention this in the movie, know Hoffa from just being missing. But he was yeah. actually a very influential person. I think they, uh, they did a, back in the a good job in this movie, though. They did a fan. Because there is a large contingent of people who are sitting there watching this on Netflix now that maybe don't even know who Jimmy Hoffa no. is. They might not even know what labor union is. Right, that's true. <laughs> and I think they, they did a good job of explaining, like, at one point he was like a name that everyone in the country knew. He was as popular as the president. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew who Jimmy Hoffa was. I can't, you know, we can't even imagine it now like a labor union leader is yeah. that famous, but it's true and that's that's what makes the story of Hoffa so interesting. And that was uh, one of the cool parts. I'm not sure how much of this is true. I know it's based on a lot of true events, right. but watching um, the rise of all these characters and the uh, dealings with the mob and uh, they pretty much told us that they did the JFK thing. It was kind of a mystery, but now we know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's, I mean, that's the thing with this is, you know, it's it's really, it's just based on this controversial story of Frank Sheeran, who, Sheehan, Sheeran, who was uh, De Niro's character and, and like his rise from, you know, coming out of the war, mm -hmm. selling beef on the, you know, to getting hooked up with the Buffalino family, yeah. uh, you know, played by Joe Pesci. Mm -hmm. And who kind of serves as like a mentor, best friend, kind of all things. Yep. And pulls him in, and next thing you know, he's he's painting houses, as he says. He becomes a hitman, a trusted figure, and and yeah, and there's things in here that you know, like the the stuff with getting Kennedy into office, and mm -hmm. like Cuba, and all these things, and how mm -hmm. you know you also you have the Italians, you have the Irish, and how they see this differently in the labor unions. One of the things I didn't know, I did not know that Hoffa backed Nixon. Yeah. And, and that was one of the huge uh, strikes. That was pretty interesting tidbit of information. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I like getting everyone in here. I love bringing Pesci out of retirement. Apparently, mm -hmm. he turned this role down like 50 times. Scorsese's been trying to make this movie for decades. I bet. And he got the rights to the book that mm -hmm. this is based on. And this is all based on a book that was based on a deathbed confession from Frank Sheeran mm -hmm. giving his story and this is all told like you know in flashbacks basically telling here's my here's my life yeah um, and so Frank's daughter one of his daughters says this is all BS you know but it does kind of fill some holes on the mystery of Hoffa and things mm -hmm. and, uh, it's it's interesting in that way this film um, you know one of the big things is obviously there's a bunch of older gentlemen now yeah um, how we can do this? We're we're telling stories from them from like their 30s through their like 70s, mm -hmm. um, and for the longest time they were trying to find actors to play the younger versions. And Scorsese was never happy with it. Like, you, you know, no one's going to be happy with like that guy doesn't look like young De Niro. That guy doesn't no. look like. And we got to this point, you know, Marvel and Disney have gotten us to this point where we can de-age people pretty good. And Scorsese but, said, "Screw it, we're just going to de-age it." Now I think that's the most talked about portion of this film is yeah. the, the de-aging and aging end of it. Mm -hmm. It's not always good. There's it's, some rough moments in there here. There are some really rough moments. We kind of hit that uncanny valley a couple of times where they don't quite look like who they are. One thing for me is De Niro's character of Frank has piercing blue eyes. Yeah. And there's a few moments in here where those blue eyes look 
like creepy. They're yeah. not real. Like, just put some blue contacts in the guy, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so that's tough. I think once they get into like their their late forties as characters, mm-hmm. like those are the we recognize those guys. It, you know, that's the that's the guys we know, and so they, they look better. They threw me off right away. They're in the scene where. Uh, uh, Joe Pesci is finally meet, meeting uh, De Niro for yeah. the first time, and he's like, calls him a young hey, man. And it's <laughs> like, yeah, hey kid. And it's like, um, this he looks like they de aged him, but he still looked like he was in his 50s. Yeah. All these right. guys, the best they could do was shave off. They just off. smoothed out the wrinkles, basically. They shaved off about good 20, 30 sure. years, but that was not yeah. enough. Um, I mean, Al Pacino, De Niro, they both look like they did in Goodfellas, Al but they were still in their 40s back then. Yeah, Al Pacino is going to be 80 next yeah. year, and there's like scenes where Frank is kicking someone on the ground, yeah, yeah. and I was like cringing. Now, De Niro is in fantastic shape. He wants to tell you in every single sure. movie, and I hope to God at 76, I look like that. It's <laughs> not going to happen. He's in better shape than I am now. Um but still, he wasn't uh, the right guy for that particular I, action. I think, at its worst, the CGI in this movie is uh, is distracting. Yeah. But I don't think it ever. I think the film surpasses that. I don't think it ruins the film. There are movies True. where we've talked about where like, oh no, that CGI was so bad, mm-hmm. I didn't want to look at it anymore. Yeah. This film was better than that. It was able to surpass that and, and move on past it. And you know, I, it's nice to see. De Niro in a good role again. It's been a long time yeah. since I saw something. My Silver Linings Playbook, I think, might have been the last one. And that was a long time ago. I, I think he's been choosing roles that just are fun. And yeah. this is a hard role. This was had to have been a hard role for all these guys. Yeah. And Scorsese must have just pleaded and begged he to did. get a lot of these guys. And it's done. interesting. I like that just because this is the fourth film that he and Pesci have been in together. All mm-hmm. of them have been great. Yeah. Raging Bull, Goodfellas, Casino, this. And this is the first time they switch roles. It's always been De Niro is the lead, Pesci's like his sidekick. Yeah. And in this one, you know, Pesci's the boss. And De Niro has to, you know, yes sir him. I thought that was kind of just an interesting dynamic because that's always been their deal. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of fun. And, you know, it's it's three and a half hours long. Yes, I mean, this is very a long. big passion project for Martin Scorsese. He's wanted this thing. And that's why I thought it was so interesting that he brought it to Netflix. Netflix said, how many Brinks trucks do you need? We'll give you all the money to <laughs> give us this movie that should be an Oscar contender. And uh, it's pretty wild when you get a movie of this level and, and actors and directors of this level. Do you think it is an uh, Oscar contender? I think it will be. You do? Yeah. Okay, cool. I think it will be. Um, just the pedigree of it all. and Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it will be. Now, does it solve necessarily the mystery of Jimmy Hoffa? No. I think it gives one one answer mm-hmm. you know you could take an option at least yeah um how uh, you know does it stack up against the other collaborations the other three movies that they've done together i think mm-hmm. those are all i think goodfellas and raging bull are superior films yeah um i think they're superior because they got them at the right time yeah um i like this movie i did um it was a little on the long side there was a lull in the middle for me um that was kind of hard to get through and that well, was a quite distance, mm-hmm. um, but the the actors not being in their prime, and as much as I love to see these guys act, it was really distracting for me, uh-huh. and it took me out of the film quite I frequently. Just, I was just enjoying seeing Pesci on screen. I love Joe Pesci, and I've I, missed him for I, so long. I love these guys, but I really, it was hard for me to try to picture them in their 30s, or even 40s, and that was a rough patch for me. So what did you give The Irishman? I gave it a four. It is a really, really good movie. I liked it a lot. It, I just found it kind of hard at times. I gave it a, a, a four and a half. This is like quintessential Scorsese filmmaking, though, like the music, mm-hmm. the, the the camera work. All of it is just like, oh, yeah, this is the master. This is what he does. You know, I mean, the way he drops songs in, it's like this is Scorsese and everyone yeah. else borrows from his plan. Um, and so, you know, the, his narrative technique, all that stuff, it's, it's just felt like classic Scorsese. Uh, yeah, there were some issues with it, but yeah. I, I, and it was an enjoyable film for I, me. I think if he could have made this even 10 years ago, oh, I think he, he would agree. have been completely I think different. he would absolutely agree. He's been trying to make this movie since the early 90s. Oh, yeah. If he could have made it in 96, it would, it would have, been, have been very happy. Yeah, we would be talking about it as the best yeah. uh, gangster film. I think, because he wanted to make this when he made Casino. I think he would have been very happy to have yeah. done that. But Even good. back in Casino, I was having a hard time with yeah. the ages. And this was 
much later. <laughs> so, so, anyways, that's on Netflix. Check out the Irishman. Yeah, definitely. If you sure. don't have Netflix now, you are the only person. Uh, just uh, email the show. Mike will give you his uh, password. Nah, Let you I log in, watch it his account. Don't worry, I'll get it for people. you. <laughs> uh, all right, the next movie we have. Moving on to what we have on the marquee this week. We have a film called Knives Out, written and directed by Ryan Johnson. This film has a cast to it. Uh, it is a classic manor mystery, which is a genre that I love. I love mm -hmm. manor mysteries, man. Um, and uh, one of my favorite directors, I love Ryan Johnson, and he is great at mysteries. Like, he did uh, one of my favorite modern noir mysteries, Brick, years ago. Yeah. And I think he, he does this really well. This one, uh, we have Christopher Plummer as Harlan Thrombey. He's a uh, patriarch of this family. Uh, very wealthy patriarch, and uh, he's got a bunch of bratty kids and family members who all pretty much leech off of him mm -hmm. in one way or another. Um, and uh, we have Anna Diarmas uh, stars as Marta, his nurse and confidant. And uh, one night, uh, Mr. Thromby turns up dead. The last one to see him was Marta, but everyone is a suspect. And we have uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Don Johnson as his daughter and son-in-law, Michael Shannon as his son, Walt, Chris Evans as his grandson, Ransom, Tony Collette as his daughter-in-law, Joni, uh, Catherine Langford and Jane Marshall as grandkids, Lakeith Stanfield as the head detective mm -hmm. comes in, and he's there, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Elliot. He's trying to solve the crime. We think it's, it's got to be a suicide. It's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. But in the background of all this, we have this shadowy character sitting there who's just been brought in. Uh, we have Daniel Craig as Benoit Blanc. Daniel Craig, just like in Logan Lucky, trying out his southern accent again <laughs> uh, to uh, sometimes good effect. Sometimes I got, it's, it's I got used to it. It was jarring at yeah. first, but I got used to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I believe he's from Kentucky, but <laughs> and, I'll take it. And I loved how they made fun of him. They kept yeah. on calling him Foghorn Leghorn. Right, the, yeah. the colonel. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the, the mansion is interesting. The cast is incredible. There are What I like about it is there's not a lot of unnecessary red herrings or... Uh -huh twists that serve no purpose at all like that drives me nuts a, a lot of modern mysteries will do that they'll just try and spin you in circles so many times mm -hmm. that you get lost and then the reveal you have to go back like i don't does that really make sense this one like it makes sense i'm, I'm good with this and it feels like an old school mystery this that's what i love about this film there's a lot of mysteries that come out um actually really not very many and we get maybe one mystery that's a true mystery every year we get things like Gone Girl, but that's more of a thriller. Yeah, last year we had the, what was the train? Uh, we had the Orient Express, yeah. which was a dud. And all these mystery movies, they come out, I get really excited, and you get the Scooby-Doo ending. All the clues don't add up. Right. This was a great story. They gave you the clues. The audience could play along, not actually play along. There's no <laughs> dot or anything. But you could actually sit in your chair, build up the clues, and figure out what is going yeah, on they weren't just along with everybody else purposefully yeah like it, it i i like that i like that um you know it's i like the relaxed pace of this film too mm -hmm. like it's not hurtling here and there to throw you off yeah no one feels like they're rushing to lead you off the trail somewhere mm -hmm. else it re resolves nicely you know without this ridiculous twist at the end yeah and I, I like Benoit Blanc as a character. I like him. He's, you know, the detective who, who chooses to remain a mystery. You uh -huh. know, at first he's just sitting there. He's just going to observe. Yeah. Oh, Lieutenant, you got it. Oh, I just have a question. <laughs> oh, just one more question. And, and it, you know, and they hint that he has a bit of notoriety, mm -hmm. you know, but you don't, you don't quite know what his past is or anything. Mm -hmm. But suddenly, next thing you know, he's... He's taking the lead. He's pulling the strings. He's unraveling people's stories. Yeah. I, it, it's a good character. I like it. Out of all mysteries that I've seen um, probably in the past 30 years, for an actual mystery, this, I think, is my favorite yeah, one. It's good. This one made sense. It had a little bit of humor. It wasn't constantly trying to uh, give you a lot of action and just for the sake of action. Mm -hmm. It was nicely paced. Humorous, exciting, it had tons of great characters. I could have gone with more getting in depth with some of the side characters. Yeah, like Catherine Langford and Jade Martell as the grandkids. I yeah. they were very one note out of this cast. I wish I could have gotten more other than like, oh, he's a little Nazi and she yeah. just likes to go smoke weed. Yeah. You know? And that was pretty <laughs> much it. And once it concentrates on two characters 
quite heavily, yeah. you can deduce what's kind of going on. It is on. fun seeing Chris Evans play against type. It is. It's I, nice I do seeing like him that. just be a jerk. Yep, and he played a jerk yeah. so fantastically. Really uh, what did you give Knives Out? Um, I gave it a five. Wow! I, I, I love kept it. on looking at this, and I was trying to find out what I disliked about the movie. And you found nothing. Couldn't find anything I disliked, and I liked everything. And this is the best mystery I have seen in a very long yeah, time. It's a really good movie. Uh, yeah, Ryan Johnson, man, he, he he does mysteries really well. Say what you want about his Star Wars films. Yeah. Some people don't like him, but uh, he does mysteries very well. Uh, I gave uh, Knives Out, I think I gave it four, or did I give it four and a half? Let's see what the score says. Four stars. Four stars. Enjoyable <laughs> film. Well worth checking out. I like it. Uh, the next one we have on the marquee, sir, is a film called Queen and Slim from director Melina Mustak uh, Matsukas. Uh -huh. uh, stars Daniel Kaluuya uh, as Slim. Mm -hmm. We don't actually know their names until the end of the movie. No. And, just, uh, and Jody Turner-Smith as the titular queen. And this uh, film is basically the world's craziest, longest first date. Uh, yes. A Tinder date <laughs> that turns uh, tragic. Things kind of start slow and progress very quickly when a traffic stop if they're on their first date turns tragic. I mean, you see it in the trailer, uh, uh, the officer who pulls him over and things go bad, he gets shot. <coughs> and uh, they do, I think they do a good job of showing like the fear and the concern of a standard traffic stop when you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, I don't have to deal with that, mm -hmm. but there are people that do. And of like this, anything could happen right now. Um, and you know, the officer gets killed. And the decision is made to go on the run immediately, leaving their lives behind. Let's go. And these two are basically learning about each other as they run from police and find themselves becoming notorious as they're on the run. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of serve as the faces for a movement, a revolution of people who are fed up with unfair treatment by the police. But they just want to get away. They want to, yeah. uh, along the way, they have some interesting interactions with people. Um, some who support them and help them, and others who don't necessarily agree with uh, what they stand for or what what they did. Um, there's a couple of happy coincidences in this film that don't sit well with me. There's a couple of there's a lot of things. He that stops didn't sit at a well. gas station at one point to rob a gas station, and mm -hmm. that didn't feel real in the least bit. That whole scene was like this would never happen. That there was a lot of things that would never happen. Yeah, um, there's some. I mean, and. and uh, to interrupt, uh, you know, Jody Turner Smith, Queen, she's a defense attorney. She, she's a lawyer, and she doesn't seem all too smart from a lot of this movie. Neither one like, of them. Yeah, are. I mean, but she's, you know, she's she's a smart lady. Yeah. And she makes dumb choices throughout a large percentage of this They're film. They're both extremely impulsive. And yeah. throughout the movie, it's uh, redundant uh, and contradictive. You'll have one character, um, like Queen, she will do something crazy and outrageous that would get her caught and you'd have slim going no 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 and then one minute after that scene is done it's the complete opposite where the other one yeah. is doing something yeah. extreme and then they're going no 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 it gets just character decisions that don't make sense every time no, it's uh there was a at the end it became really obvious to me where it just stood out like a sore thumb thumb where one person did something extreme outside of a car in the daylight mm -hmm. and then Literally 15 seconds after that scene was done, she's yelling at Slim <laughs> for being outside of a country road in the dark. Yeah, yeah. It's like, look at all the things you've done throughout this whole movie. That being said, though, like I, I really like the quiet moments between them. Mm -hmm. I thought their chemistry was really good. Yeah. You could feel their chemistry like growing through the film. And so I liked a lot of the quiet moments between them. Is they're really learning about each other. Yeah. <laughs> so they're thrown into this Bonnie and Clyde situation. I think Melina is great at finding a shot. There's a lot of really cool shots, yeah. like in the beginning when they're on their first date and they're in the car. Yeah. They take one shot where Slim, he's driving, but they pan him to the left of... Yeah, he's leaning one way, she's leaning the yeah. other. Yeah, and it's to focus in, and it's probably beating you in the head too, but it's like they are not together. Yep. It's supposed to feel like they are separated even though they're still in the same car. Right. And there's little tidbits like that throughout the whole movie, but a lot of the situations that they were in were extremely contradictive, redundant and improbable um the the there was a one weird scene what i really feel like this movie what it needed was a middle school english teacher someone that's really hopeful just you know Editing. circling things and saying i like the idea but yeah. i really flesh this, you, you flesh this one out this one's kind of weird but i like your ideas yeah. stuff like that there was a scene where there's this um protest 
that becomes violent in a small town and it just springs out of some random street yeah, it just seems and it was to just come out of nowhere really weird and it's supposed to be a powerful moment where there's also um a copulation between uh yeah. queen and slim We're happening at the same time but it just they're came unaware off. of what they started and instead of a powerful moment it becomes just a weird sure. moment where it felt like it was more exploitative of sex and what is going on with this other thing um and that part i just left me questioning but i do love the shots the acting is fantastic yeah, great, great acting uh what did you give queen and slim i gave it a three um i liked it mm -hmm. but there's a lot wrong with it yeah i agree i gave it three and a half Hey, Bokeem Woodbine gives me an extra half star. I love him as Uncle Earl. Yeah, he was he's really pretty good. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> really, I like him a lot. Uh, let's take a look back, sir, uh, really quickly for our movie throwback. Let's go back to one of uh, one of the great Scorsese, Pacino, De Niro team-ups. We've had a few to choose from. But we are going back to Goodfellas, uh, one of the legendary gangster films that uh, also based on the true story of Henry Hill mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kind of set the stereotype uh, for the Scorsese choice of music, um, uh, using a lot of Rolling Stones, things mm -hmm. like that, uh, and just so many iconic scenes in here, you know, of just, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think, I'm funny? Uh, oh, you know, yeah. All of these, we slice the garlic with a razor blade so it melts, and, you know, just all these little scenes in here that are iconic. A movie that holds up incredibly well. I rewatched it this week. Just, I, I think I've watched this movie, I don't know, 50 times. It, but. I've watched it, yeah, about that same thing. It was one of those movies that kept on repeating and repeating in yeah. my house. It is a fantastic movie with a great score, um, great music in the background Everything. that just fits every scene, the end, when you have that. It, it, just the paranoia of yeah. Henry Hill, it, the music swells to that point. Yep, and, it's, yeah, it is stuff. classic film. Um, definitely check this out yeah. while you're watching. Watch them um, both. Watch them both. Watch them both at the same time. <laughs> All right, let's take a look ahead, sir. What is going to be coming out the weekend of December 13th? We have a few films. Uh, first one is Uncut Gems, the movie uh, from A24 with Adam Sandler in it, a I've drama that looks... I never thought I'd say I'm looking forward to Adam Sandler Safety film. Brothers film. I love them. <laughs> I, this looks really interesting. Yeah, it I looks hope great. it's as good as it looks. Yep. Um, we also have Bombshell, new movie for starring Charlize Theron and Margot Robbie and Nicole Kidman about the Fox News craziness that happened a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also have Jumanji, the next level. We're going back into the world of Jumanji. We're bringing our friends back with some new ones and maybe new people in, in familiar bodies. Should be fun. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, we have Black Christmas. This is the one where some students are stalked by a stranger during Christmas break, Mike. We got our... I'm pretty stoked. Got our horror movie. <laughs> Uh, and then lastly, we have, based on a true story, we have Richard Jewell, the film, the biopic about the man who uh, was basically uh, convicted in the court of public opinion for being the Atlantic uh, Olympic bomber, uh, Atlanta mm. bomber, and then uh, years later, you know, afterwards we find out, oh, it wasn't, but uh, boy, everyone thought he was. And it's going to be a busy, busy week. Busy week, man. Yeah. Well, it's you know, holiday season. We, this is when all the movies come hurtling in. Yeah. Uh, before we leave, though, we want to thank our sponsor, Palace Theater here in Sub Prairie, Marcus Theaters. Thank you for sponsoring our program. We do appreciate it. We always, especially these busy holiday season, man. Mm -hmm. We love coming in there, getting in our dream lounger. Uh, you also go down there and maybe get get a gift card for the kids. You mm -hmm. know, eat a waffle sandwich. Ooh, waffle sandwich. Those were good. Right. Those are delicious. <laughs> right. Absolutely right about that. Uh, so again, thank you to the Palace. Uh, next week, we have a few films we're going to be talking about, sir. We have Playmobil the movie. Mm -hmm. We have Dark Waters, uh, starring uh, Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. It's like an interesting film. We have Honey Boy, which is the uh, kind of uh, true story of Shia LaBeouf's life growing up. About his dad. He, he plays his own dad in this movie. Hmm. How about that? Looks like a bit of a trip. <laughs> uh, and then uh, for our streaming spotlight next week, we have a film uh, starring Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson called Marriage Story, which I've heard good things about. No. So that'll be our streamer for next week. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure to tune in for that. But until that time, I'm Jameson. I'm Mike Roth. Thanks for watching.